All right, uh, good, good morning. Um, what, what we're going to do in this session, it's, it's a, we're going, we thought what would be the best way to approach it is that we give you an overview of the AACSB standards, and then in the next session we'll do a comparison between AACSB uh, standards and La Member standards. So we thought we'd do it, some in-depth coverage on AACSB standards. So firstly, uh, you, you want to know a little bit about AACSB, I hope. Um, so we are the world's oldest, largest and most prestigious global network of business schools. Uh, we were founded in 1916 in the US. And the, the A, what we stand for is the Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business it used to be the American Association. Until 1999, that's when AACSB went global. Okay? So it was America, and then America and Canada, and then uh, global. Uh, we're in over 100 countries and territories. The head office is in Tampa. The Asia Pacific office is in Singapore, where, where Hannah, Leanne, and myself are based. And then there's an office in Amsterdam for the Europe, Middle East, and Africa. When you uh, go for accreditation, you will have to talk about your mission, so we have one as well. So our mission is about fostering engagement, accelerating innovation, and amplifying impact in business education. And these words, engagement, innovation, and impact, are key words in our accreditation. We call them the pillars. We have a vision. We see business as a force for good, and so business education is contributing to that. And you can see our vision is to transform business education globally for positive societal impact. That's a bigger purpose. All right? We're, so the question is, why are we doing research? Why are we educating students? Because we're preparing them to make a difference. In their, in their companies, in broader society, in their communities. So what are we? AACSB is a connector and convener. We bring together business schools. And here today, with uh, uh, FEB, UGM, this is an example. We've brought together business schools from Indonesia. We bring together educators, learners, and business. And, and business, we can include business, government, not-for-profits, and broader communities. We provide thought leadership. What's interesting, it's not actually AACSB in the organisation, it's AACSB, the community, that provides thought leadership, because it comes from you. It comes from our members, uh, where, we get, where we get thought leadership to distribute. And we do accreditation, which is the last part around quality assurance for business schools, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, a few numbers. We've got 1,744 educational members. Um, I said 5% of the world's business schools are accredited. Look at the last three bullets. We've done an estimate, if you add up all the budgets of all the business schools who are members, it's $50 billion a year spending on, on education activities. And if, oh, sorry, it, just, it always bounces forward. Did I go back? No. How do I go back? Sorry. Got it. Okay. The third, and if you look at the number of faculty working in members of AACSB, it's about 174,000, and 5 million students around the world are touched, are involved with AACSB schools. So it's a, it's a big, significant community. Uh, here is the... Uh, Membership. So the first, we, we have three regions, the Americas, which is Canada, US, and uh, Latin America, uh, Asia Pacific, and EMEA, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, remember, AACSB only existed in the Americas until 1999. So it's only in the last 22 years that it's been in Asia Pacific, that it's been in EMEA. And if you look at those membership numbers, AAC, Asia Pacific is now 24%. And if you add that together with a mayor, 55% of the members are now outside of the Americas. 
accredited, and surprisingly, most of them are in the Americas. Why? Because they've been doing it for 100 years. Um, but in Asia Pacific, there are 172 accredited schools, 18% of the total. Um, in progress, those are schools who have been approved to enter the process, and they're somewhere, so they've been approved, but they haven't reached the end yet. So in process, uh, you can see 37% are from Asia Pacific. And you, the major in process is in Asia Pacific and EMEA, and the growth in membership is Asia Pacific and, and, and EMEA. All right. Yes, Indonesia. You can go on our website, and you, uh, and you can find who those members are. It's not a secret. And some of them are in the room here. Uh, accredited schools, uh, Universitas Indonesia was the fourth accredited school, and that was last week. Our first accredited school was Faculty of Economics and Business, University of Gajamada, and we have Venus, who's one of our accredited schools, and the other one is IT Bandung. We have three schools in process. That means they've started the process. But as I say, we don't tell you the names. Uh, we don't tell anyone the names of schools in process because if they don't complete, then that, it, would, it would affect their reputation. But I know schools will tell you that's okay. They'll tell you, but, but we don't as an organisation. Uh, just the team in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, and we have uh, three of us here today. You can see Hannah Zainolden. She's the membership expert in our office, and she has responsibility for Indonesia. So those of you who are... So Hannah, could you stand up so everyone can see you, please? Hannah Zainolden. So, in fact, um, all of us have knowledge of, of membership, but she, she is the one who is the expert. And so if you really want to, to, to know things about it, Hannah's the one to talk with. Uh, Leanne is a Senior Accreditation and Member Services man Manager. So, Leanne, stand up, please. So, she also helps like at events like this, where it's about membership as well, but her... The bulk of her part is, is working with accredited schools and in process schools. So once you start process, you will be allocated uh, a, an accreditation manager, accreditation liaison, who will help you and work with you as you go through the process. Um, we, al we also have our Angelina, who's the centre manager. She's actually Indonesian, so Angelina Chandra is, um, is from Indonesia. And then... Uh, uh, we have someone in Shanghai, that's Guo Dong Zhu. Uh, Amy Memon, who's uh, based in Mumbai, she, she also does accreditation um, manager, so she works with schools as well. And Natalia is 0.5 with us, 0.5 with the mayor. She's also an accreditation manager. And then Esther is marketing, 0.5 with us and 0.5 with the mayor. So in, the, in, in membership, the key person is, is Hannah, although... Um, it's part of Leanne's job. And then the accreditation part is Leanne, Amy, and Natalia. Guaidong is also membership. Right, that's who we are. Now, let's get to the standards. If we could change slide decks. Okay, so let's talk about our standards. Our first standard started in 1919. There have been a number of changes. The latest standards are 2020. And there was a task force set up in, in 2018. 16 deans from around the world that reflected the geographic spread of accredited schools. And together, we met with schools, uh, we presented at meetings, we got input uh, via you know, email and whatever. Uh, we came up with drafts, we shared it. And over 18 months, we developed the 2020 standards. They were introduced in 2020. And these are global standards. They're not American standards. AACSB is a global organisation. And so that task force, and I was fortunate I was a co-chair. This was before I joined AACSB. I joined AACSB in 2020. Before that, I was a business dean. I was an economist, academic in business schools, and I was a deputy vice chancellor. And so I was a co-chair of the task force before I joined AACSB. Um, 
So I was representing Asia Pacific. There was someone uh, from the Philippines and, and someone who was at a Chinese university. We were the three on the task force. So it's not US standards. These are global standards. All right. So in the standards, firstly, well, one of the things in the front we have is something called guiding principles. What are guiding principles? These are the principles that underpin the accreditation. They are principles that accredited schools commit to. Uh, so they cover sort of the behaviours, the values, the attitudes, and the choices that you make. When you enter initial accreditation, you, you, you do an eligibility application, and in that, you talk about how you align with the guiding principles. And every time there is an accredit, you, when you're accredited, and once you're accredited five years later, uh, when you're, you go through the continuous improvement review, you have to explain how you still align with those principles. So I'm not going to go through them all, but they're 10, and uh, you can see what they are. They cover you know, ethics and, te and integrity. So what systems and processes do you have, say, around academic honesty, about complaints processes, and how do you work uh, with your schools? Okay, societal impact, you can look through. I'll just pick up a couple. Mission-driven. In other words, you have a mission where you identify your identity and a vision where you identify where you're going and that that is, is, helps drive your decision. So that's what that one's about. Um, and you can see there's a number there. Continuous improvement is a key idea under accreditation. So you'll, you will need to identify that you align with those. I won't go through all of those because we don't have, have enough time, but you'll find them in the, in the, in, in the standards. So let so that's in the front of the standards, and then we come to the standards themselves. We have nine. Nine in three categories. Uh, strategic management and innovation, learner success, and thought leadership, engagement, and societal impact. And you can see there under each, so you can see the standards on, um, on, on strategic planning, and I'm going to talk about each of these briefly in turn. Anyway, you can see the nine than I'm there, and I'm going to go briefly through the, each of them so that you have a, um, an understanding on this. So let's have a look. Standard one is strategic planning. So what does it say? Well, firstly, you must have a strategic plan, all right? A well-documented strategic plan, and you should develop that by engaging with your stakeholders, internal and external as appropriate. So faculty leadership team, students, staff, the university, external stakeholders, okay, the ones that are relevant for you. Now, of course, the decisions are not made by all of those, but you need to engage those as appropriate in the process. And you'll see in blue there, you'll have a clear and focused mission. So the mission, actually the mission we say is made up of the, um, the, the, the mission and the vision, but the mission is your identity. So it needs to be specific enough. It's, it's not the, if you say my mission is we're going to do great teaching, great research, and we're going to make a difference in the community, that could be any business school. It doesn't say what's the essence of your school, all right? So you need to have a clear and focused mission that shows that it's your school. In other words, why do people choose you? Why do students come to you? Why do faculty work with you? Why do external stakeholders work with you and not some other school? What is your essence? In the accreditation, it's, uh, the key is that you have a mission and a vision is where you want to get to. That's your future state. And the accreditation is, is about achieving that. Is it high quality? And what are you doing? So... That all comes from that, um, that mission. Secondly, you need to monitor progress. So you have a strategy, you have a mission, and you need to check how you're going. You know, reflection, evaluation. Are we doing well? Can we do better? Where can we uh, improve? And thirdly, that you embrace innovation. You remember one of those um, guiding principles was continuous improvement? So... By that, 
Uh, in a, by innovation, we don't mean it needs to be new in the world. We mean it needs to be new in your school. So you, you, your strategy is about improving things, moving things forward. That's what we mean by innovation. And in this standard, you identify the area that your school wants to have a positive societal impact. Okay, so that's standard one. That's strategic planning. Standard two is basically, do you, given your mission and given what you're trying to achieve, do you have appropriate and sufficient financial, virtual, and physical resources? You see that key word, given your mission? This is all mission-driven. We're not telling you what resources you need. We're not telling you what financial resources or um, physical or virtual but given your mission, given what you're doing, do you have resources that help you achieve that and in sufficient uh, quantity? So that's, that's standard two. And standard three is faculty and professional staff resources. So if you look, there's a number of parts. The first in 3.1 is do you have sufficient enough faculty to do all the things that you want to do, your teaching, your research, your student advising, your uh, outreach, all of those things that you, that your mission and the activities that come from that, do you have sufficient faculty? And there's a particular way that we get you to measure that. So that's the first part. So the first thing is enough. Do you have enough? Sufficient. The second is, are they appropriately qualified? All right, so that's what... And we look at this in two ways. What's the initial qualification someone has? And then how do they stay current? Now, when you get into here, we have um, <laughs> the uh, Matrix. It's not like the movie, but it could be. Um, but we recognize that there are different kinds of faculty that schools could have. Because we're professional schools. And if you think about professional schools... That means there needs to be the academic part and the professional part. All right, so within your faculty, there will be some who are PhD qualified and doing research. What you could say is sort of experts in their field. And the way they maintain is through research because they send their research out for peer review. And that's the way they're maintaining their currency in their field. And you have some who are industry experience, and they might have a master's degree, and they're connecting with industry. And you might have some with PhDs who are connecting with industry. You might have some with masters who are doing research. AACSB, our standards, allow all of those. There are some ratios about how many should be in that expert category, but we're professional schools. So... The mix of faculty that you have um, on those that are, you know, PhD research active, those that are masters and industry focused, or a mix of those, that exists in our standards. So in this, in 3.2, you develop within the principles we give you criteria for faculty, understanding there will be a mix because we're professional schools. And again, how many of the uh, research, PhD research, and how many of the industry linked d depends on your mission. If your mission is to drive forward knowledge in the world, theoretical knowledge, drive it forward, you're going to have a lot of those PhD research active, quite a high percentage. If your mission is a more practical one, you still need some experts, you know, PhD, but you'll need more of the ones who are connecting with industry. Mission driven. Right, so that's, that's faculty. Do you have enough? And are they appropriately qualified? And how do they stay up to date? The third is about professional staff. And it's the same question. Do you have sufficient professional staff uh, to do all the things you need to do? And the other bit is appropriate. Because as we move forward, and we're doing a lot more digitally, you know, um, then the, the, the qualifications and the, the training of professional staff the requirements change. So that's about professional staff. And the fourth bit is simply for your academic staff, 
and your, sorry, your academic faculty and your professional staff, how do you recruit, develop, uh, monitor, reward, incentivize them? So that's 3.4. So this is a big standard. Sufficient, do you have sufficient faculty? Are they appropriately qualified? Do you have sufficient and appropriate professional staff? And how do you uh, develop, reward, incentivize uh, and uh, faculty and, how, and staff? All right, that's standard three. Standard, f ah, hang on, how do I go back this one? Standard four is not there. Okay. All right, I'll talk about standard four because it's quite important. <laughs> It's called curriculum. <laughs> so in standard four, um, don't worry, it's on, my, it's on my pin drive, but it's not on your one. It's okay, don't worry. Um, standard four basically says that you should have a curriculum that is current, forward-looking, relevant, and appropriate. Okay? And it should include in it technology where it makes sense. Secondly, in standard four, you should have systems and processes to start new degrees, to close down degrees, to review degrees, to, to introduce new courses, to, to monitor uh, the curriculum and to monitor how it's going and to make changes in, in, in the curriculum. So there's, those are the two main the two main Three main aspects if you think about the curriculum. Current, relevant, uh, forward-looking. Uh, you should have processes to, to manage it and, and technology should be used in it as and where appropriate. Okay. It's really important that, that um, it wasn't there. All right, number five. For Indonesian schools and for most in most countries, this requires you to do something that you don't currently do. Um, it's called assurance of learning. So what is it? Assurance of learning, if you take each of your programs, and you might have, I don't know if you call it a graduate profile, no? Or what are the goals of your program? You'll have something like that, right? Okay. So in here, but you don't actually explicitly assess whether the students are achieving those goals. The way it works is the same in my school and most schools. You have, a, you have goals for the program or a profile, and then what you have is you have all your courses, and you say if they pass all the assessment in every course, we'll say they've met our, our, our program goals. That's how it works. It's not very often that we map that individual assessment to the goals. So... What we require in assurance of learning is for each program you identify, we call it learning competencies, but they're the goals. So for instance, it might be um, applying, being able to apply disciplined knowledge. It might be able to communicate effectively. It might be able to work in teams. Uh, whatever your goals are for the program. In assurance of learning, you need to assess in the program how your learners are doing against those goals. So explicitly, looking at how the learners are doing against your goals. Now, if you think about it, it's such an obvious and sensible idea. If you've got goals for a program, you want to know how your learners are doing against the goals for that program. That's what assurance of learning is. However, in nearly every country, uh, the way we teach, the way we assess, we don't do that. We just assess in each course. And if they pass all the courses... We, we hope that we develop courses that would match the goals. That's how we do it. But in assurance of learning, you must explicitly assess those goals. Now, it doesn't mean you need to do it hundreds of times. You can do it maybe only once, depending where you do it. Some schools do it twice. So, but it's explicitly assessing the goal. If it's something around being able to make present, you know, communicate orally, then you actually need to assess how do you, can your learners communicate orally because that's a goal of, of your program, if that's what it is. Okay, so, as you say, basically the question, I put it in blue, how are your learners performing against the learning competencies you have for your programs? And how do you use that information to make the learning of the students better, to make your curriculum better? All right? 
It's a great idea, but none of no schools we introduced in our 2003 standards. This was innovative, and it's it's really powerful. Uh, now, if, that's AACSB. The advantage of what you're doing over these days is in the room uh, we have some accredited schools. You can ask them what's involved in this, and uh, is it is it valuable? That's the benefit. All right. So that's the key part in, in standard five. Standard six is about your learners. Given your mission, who are your learners? Which students do you bring in? Uh, and, uh, you know, do you accept, if, if you bring them from another school, how do you give uh, transfer credits? If you've got partnerships, you know, how does all that, with uh, international students, I used to have articulations. Students would study, say, in Vietnam, VNU, for two years, and they'd come to my school, Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand, and we'd give them credit from their study. So what do you have there? How do you support students if they're, if they're having learning difficulty through your program? And so that's, um, and how do you help prepare them for life after studying with you? It might be going to study at, an, at another institution. It might be going to work. It might be starting their own business. How do you help prepare them for that next step? And the second part is, as business schools, we all make promises are too strong. We make uh, commitments to our learners. Come and study with us. Study our Master in Management or our Bachelor in Management, and then you will be able to do X, Y, and Z. You know, it will take you to a great career or it will take you here. So the question is, are you following up and seeing what's going on? And is... Uh, and, and if, if that isn't, if the, if the promise isn't being met, then how are you changing things to try to improve it? Remember, continuous improvement. No one's perfect. No school is perfect. So they're continuously improving. All right, that's standard six. Standard seven is teaching effectiveness. And in there, you should be evaluating your faculty, but it says here multi-measures. What it means is you can't just have one. Historically, schools used to do a satisfaction survey, you know, by students, and that they just take that. All of the measures of, of teaching have their strengths and weaknesses, right? There's no one perfect. That's why it's worth looking at having more than one. So, you know, it could be some, as well as that, you might have observations. You could have people writing reflective uh, statements on what they're doing. There's a range of ways. So multi-measure means not just one. You need more than one approach to assess how your faculty are doing. That you have development activities. Now, you don't have to do them yourself. It could be the university actually does them as long as they are available to your faculty to improve their, their pedagogy. And faculty need to be current. Remember back in Standard 3, that was where they're current in their discipline through research. Here, they also need to be current in teaching, in pedagogy. So how do you do that? How do you keep faculty up to date? And how do you know your teaching is working? It's making a difference. There's a number of ways that, that we can look at it. You know, it could be uh, sat satisfaction or success. But these other affirmations, maybe you're winning teaching awards, right? Recognition. Maybe other schools are asking you to come and talk with them because they've heard that you've got a really innovative, effective way to do group work or to teach cases or something. So that's a way, you, what we could say is other affirmations. I know in my country there used to be national awards each year for university teachers. And that was a way that we could say, right, in our school, you know, we had these two people who got a national award and they had to fill in a portfolio to show their impact. So teaching effectiveness is really important. Let me get to the last part of the standards, and I will leave you some time, Leanne, for your part. All right. This is the impact of scholarship. The, the, the point is... While we do count in AACSB, we're more interested in the difference things make. And when, I, uh, when we do the session, we're looking at the LUM member uh, compared with us. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the overall approach uh, to assessment. We'll have it in that session. But here, scholarship. Is your research making a difference? I, I used to tell a story. Um, this was back in the days when uh, journals were made of paper. They weren't electronic, you know, and you, and you used to have on your shelves, I was an economist, I had the American Economic Review and the Quarterly Journal of Economics and, you know, the Journal of Labour Economics, etc. And so we, it was like this, and, and the dean of one of the other faculties in my university, he said, 
We don't want cockroach research. And say, so what's, what's cockroach research? And he'd say, cockroach research means the only people who consume your research are the cockroaches who are slowly working their way through the paper on your shelf. We want research that makes a difference. All right? And so to do that, it actually changes slightly the way you think about research. Who am I trying to affect? It might be knowledge, academic community, academic impact. But if your mission has got something about affecting communities, then you also need to talk about how your research might be impacting that, right? Not just the academic part. So it could also be how, how is your work making a difference to practice? How is it making a difference to policy, depending on your mission? Impact is what matters. So we talk about high quality, high impact, and we call it intellectual contributions, but that's, that's the research part. High quality, high impact. And the second one, that it's affecting theory or policy or practice or pedagogy. And in the standards, we ask for some exemplars of uh, your research that is having a societal impact. Uh, we'll need longer than five minutes because we started late. We need 20, sorry. Because <laughs> <laughs> we started late, yep. But I'll be a bit shorter in the next one because I used a bit of those slides in this one. Okay. Um, all right, so that's research. And the last bit I'm going to talk about before I hand over to Leanne, the ninth standard is engagement and societal impact. And that is saying, apart from research, because you remember, we talk about the impact of research in 8.3. Standard nine is what are all the ways that your school, apart from, apart from the research, is making a difference in society. But it's connected. If you think, remember back at standard one, I said you had to identify the aspect or the area where you wanted to make a difference in your strategy. That's what you're picking up here, the story about how you are making a difference. So I will now, those are the, an overview of the standards. We actually have a 12-hour <laughs> seminar that goes into depth on this. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll hand over to Leanne, who's going to now, in the standards, talk about the process. Thanks, Jeff. Middle one. Do you want to go back? Okay. So um, I'll be going through with you the accreditation process, but before we even start, we need to consider this very first step, which is the accreditation scope. So this accreditation scope basically covers what will be reviewed under this AACSB accreditation. And there are actually two levels to this. The first level is your first question here. So this question looks at what is the accrediting entity? So a common misconception is that AACSB accredits single business degree programs. So I have schools asking me, you know, I have an MBA, I want to just accredit my MBA. Is that okay? So actually, what I want to clarify is AACSB accredits the entity. So we are looking at the entity that offers business degrees and our review covers holistically the whole entity. Uh, the programs it offers, the faculty, the research, the teaching, as you know, Jeff has just mentioned, there are so many slides that are covering different aspects of the entity. So um, for AACSB purpose, in looking at entity, I'll just give you a little background. Uh, when ACSB accreditation first started back in US, so we only had this option for schools, which is institutional accreditation. So institutional accreditation means that accreditation is at the university level. So um, this was because in US at that time, we only had uh, organization structures where there was just one business school in the entire institution. So very straightforward, they simply needed to apply as the institution and the review that covers the entire institution would just be all the business degree programs within the business school. But when AECSB moved to other parts of the world as we became more globalized, so you know in Asia Pacific, in the Europe region, we have a lot of different organization structures. So you have multiple schools with very different missions that are in the same university. 
And it became more complex for uh, the schools because now they have to think, oh, my colleague uh, running the agribusiness school, um, I want to go for accreditation. I am the FEB here, but I don't know whether my colleague in agribusiness wants to go through accreditation. Uh, if they do, how do we coordinate? Because we have different mission and ACSB is mission driven. Uh, so all this complexity um, came back to us and we decided actually back in 2013, so under the 2013 standards, we came up with a second option, which is the uh, unit of accreditation as the option. So this means that schools can then choose. So instead of going for accreditation as the institution, we say now you can consider transferring that institutional uh, status to the unit status. So this means the entity that will go through accreditation will be a business school. So the kind of questions that you need to think about before even applying for AACSB is what is your organization structure like? Uh, if you take a look around you, um, are there any other schools that are actually offering business degrees? Uh, in some cases, uh, it may not even be a business school. You could have, say, an, a continuing education school. They may offer a BBA to working professionals. And I think in some Indonesian schools that I have seen, uh, you have a humanities school or a communication school, and there is a HRM degree, so a human resource management degree. And that is outside of your econs and business school. So in that case, it's quite likely that if you are the FEB here and you know your other schools do not want to go through accreditation, so you need to apply for this unit option. So this is a case-by-case -case, um, approach. Uh, as you go through this, talk to AACSB staff such as myself, my colleagues, you can talk to Jeff as well, and uh, we will help you to go through these questions. So there is a separate form that needs to be completed. It's called the uh, unit of accreditation form. You have to show how you are different from the other business schools in terms of the branding and in terms of how the external market, such as uh, potential students from high school, their parents, employers, government agencies, how this external market views you as being different from say the uh, faculty of every business or faculty of communications that also offers business degrees. Right, so that is the first question. And the second question that we look at in terms of scope is then the programmatic scope. So this covers uh, basically what the business, what are the business degree programs that will be in scope. We, how we consider a business degree is looking at the content that is in that program. So if the content is 25% um, is or more for a bachelor's degree, or if it is 50% or more for a graduate's degree, we consider this a business degree program. So if you have, say, a partnership program with the engineering school, it's a Bachelor of Engineering Management. And if you look at the program, so it contains some business subjects. You are helping the school out. So, you know, you have uh, some faculty who are teaching in that uh, engineering management program. But if you look at the program as a whole, the content is less than 25% uh, and it is also not being marketed as belonging to your business school. So it is being marketed as uh, an engineering focused degree. So likely, you can exclude this program. So the two things that we look at is the content of business uh, within that program as well as whether we market uh, this program as business related. So these two questions you want to work out first before you even start. right? So lots to think about, but now I'll just go through with you this uh, accreditation uh, process. So um, you just mentioned the guiding principles earlier. So the guiding principles are what? A school that is interested in AACSB accreditation and wants to apply for accreditation will show that they um, are committed to. So in the eligibility application, we call EA for short, you need to um, explain how you are committed to these guiding principles as well as to demonstrate that there are sufficient resources in terms of uh, your finances, as well as um, in terms of faculty, to be at a good starting point to move through the process uh, successfully once accepted. So this doesn't mean that, oh, you have to meet standard three or standard two immediately, no. But at this stage, you still want to have some level of uh, resources that can demonstrate uh, the higher probability of moving through smoothly. 
So again, at this stage, we, we do a lot of outreach here in our office. You know, we are interested in ACSB. We can help you to look at your resources, uh, faculty-wise, and how you can go forward to plan um, you know, this next stage. Uh, so after your eligibility application uh, goes through, so it goes through this committee called the Initial Accreditation Committee, IAC for short. Um, so if they accept this EA, then you will be in the process. So congratulations at this stage. And now the, the actual work really begins. You know, you have a time, a timeline to go through. Um, you will be assigned a mentor. So the mentor is a very important person. Uh, he or she is the dean or associate dean. Uh, of an ACSB accredited school. So someone who has direct experience leading his or her school through this accreditation process and very important person. So this mentor will help to ask um, guiding questions to you so that you can self-reflect. Because in this stage, you will be actively looking at the standards. You will be preparing this initial self-evaluation report and in that report, uh, you will have to show um, them, you have to describe, are you aligned with the standard or not? It's an honest reflection. Uh, so don't worry at this stage if you do not meet the standard. Uh, the schools are not expected to meet the standard at this first stage. For example, um, you know, standard five assurance of learning takes some time. So schools do not necessarily meet that at this stage. Standard three as well. So what is more important is that you have actionable plans to show how you will be going to align with the standards once the ISA is accepted. So following ISA acceptance, you will be moving to this stage called the, um, the action implementation phase, which is when you will be actively closing the gaps that you had outlined in your ISA. So for short, the ISA has two parts. One is your internal self-assessment, the second part is you need to also have plans to show how you are going to move forward. So it can't be very vague. You know, a school cannot say, oh, I have met all the standards, nothing needs to be done. You know, the IEC will uh, reject that ISER and ask you to revise it. Uh, some schools, they may say, oh, I think I have some issues, but there are no plans or it's not concrete. Uh, there are no financial resources. Uh, the strategic plan, you know, may not be very clear, so you can get questions at those stages and it goes to a revised uh, and resubmit. So once this plan, however, once you have written a good ISA, uh, it gets accepted, you'll be moved to this stage um, of, as I mentioned, action implementation phase. It takes up to three years here and um, you will be giving annual reports to the IAC on your progress. If you demonstrate that you are mostly aligned with the standards. So you're at a stage where you are ready to be reviewed by the peer review team. So the peer review team is a team of three uh, deans of AACSB accredited schools. So they are, they already go to your school and they'll assess your school or whether you have, that your school has aligned with those nine standards. So uh, at this final stage, your school will no longer be working with the mentor. So the mental support will end. Uh, however, the peer review team, uh, the chair will be the main person to take over this work and um, he or she will help you in developing the self-evaluation report. So this self-evaluation report is very similar to the first stage ISA. Uh, it is also a very in-depth analysis of how you are aligned with the nine standards. The, the main difference is that in the ISA stage, it's okay to show you have not aligned, right? But in the final stage, you have to show that you are already aligned after going through all these uh, three stages. Um, so the peer review team chair is someone you'll work with closely, coordinating with him or her on the visit logistics. So this person will also work with the other two members in the team, and it will all culminate in the actual uh, visit. So uh, this campus visit, once it goes through successfully, the team will submit a report recommending extension, uh, rec sorry, recommending initial accreditation to the committee. Uh, if the committee agrees, they will concur, and then this decision will go to the board of directors. So at this final stage, if the board of directors um, confirms that we call it a ratification, which they do, there's no objections that I've heard so far, uh, then you will, will have gone to the final stage, which is accreditation, so congratulations. So schools at this stage, they will then be moved into what we call the continuous improvement review process. 
And um, it means that they cannot rest. It means that once you know you already achieved accreditation, in five years time you have to you have a, a review visit. So this is really the spirit of uh, continuous improvement that we have with AACSB. Um, so this is what I just sum up. Those three stages is being broken down into uh, a timeline. Uh, you can see there is seven years here, but um, it's not that a school will need all seven years because uh, each stage here represents the maximum timing. Uh, the first stage of two years for ISER, the second stage up to three years where you are actively closing gaps and giving annual progress reports, and the last stage which is uh, when you are working towards uh, the peer review team visit, so up to two years for that. Uh, most schools would take about four to five years because they can shorten the timing. So this green arrow here shows that um, some schools will not necessarily need the full three years of the progress report stage to move to the visit. It could happen much earlier. So all of this depends, of course, again, on each school. It's a case by case. Um, and you can also see year zero. So year zero is what we just discussed in the first slide, the first step. So what is the entity to be accredited? Uh, is it the unit? Uh, is unit necessary? So if unit is necessary, there is that form to fill and you know you just work through with your ACSB staff, uh, myself or my colleagues, and we will help you along the way. Right, so this is the support that we give to schools in the process. Uh, you will have a mentor, as I've just mentioned, um, an ACSB accreditation liaison. So this was someone who, like myself, who understands the process as well as uh, we can address technical questions related to the standards. Uh, so if you have anything that you're not sure of, you can say, hey, Lian, I've got this question. I'm not sure what do you mean by um, standard three faculty qualifications. Can you give me some, um, some explanation? You know, I want to clarify this. So you can ask your staff liaison. And this staff liaison continues with you even after you have gone through accreditation. So the staff liaison relationship is forever. So um, you also, we encourage you to take advantage of the peer schools in your country who have gone through accreditation. And I think it's great that we have so many, um, you know, four schools now in Indonesia. So they are the ones you want to also consult with. Uh, they can help you out. More importantly, uh, sometimes um, because ACSP standard is mission driven. Uh, and when you talk about raising your quality, uh, often you need to do some kind of standard setting. So if you are identifying peer schools that are similar to your school, uh, you may be asked by the committee on how you are doing against uh, the standards that have been set by your peers. So you want to check and see how they are also um, setting their criteria, for example, for certain uh, standards, especially standard three. Um, you are also encouraged to network on AACSB Exchange. So this is a member-only uh, member portal. Uh, there's a very active discussion on questions related to standards. Uh, so it's called a member forum. So anyone with that, you know, even if you have not uh, entered the process, you can start asking questions there. Um, and of course, uh, we also encourage um, events such as this one, where you know they have ACSB focus, so you get to meet with um, others who have also gone through the process. So this is the Business Education Alliance. This is the value of being part of the ACSB network. So it's a global network. I've just mentioned the exchange. Uh, besides. AACSB accreditation focused discussions, you can also talk about other stuff. So there are other um, interesting topics that are available on the exchange. It's worth exploring. There are also regional networks. So we have uh, this Asia Pacific regional network that is really solely for your schools. You drive the content, you discuss the issues, uh, not necessarily related to accreditation. It could be just AP business trends. You know, you can discuss it there. And um, on uh, certain, certain times of the year. So we have two uh, on-site conferences, normally pre-pandemic and starting again, uh, AP. So we have regional network meeting face-to-face uh, -face and they'll discuss. Uh, so we have it for the next, uh, next week's um, Asia Pacific conference. And uh, we also want to push these career services because any member school can promote job postings on this career connection for free. So this is also a good, good way if you are thinking about recruiting uh, faculty globally. So you can make use of that. Uh, we've talked about QA. 
um, learning and development events. So we have conferences, seminars, uh, digital learning. So we really expanded a lot on that uh, because of the pandemic. You can see some webinars, um, for example, related to blockchain. So it's not necessarily just ACSB accreditation alone. Uh, it could be related to pedagogy, teaching development, uh, research. Um, and of course, if you want, you can also try to, if, to raise your profile. There are also exhibition and sponsorship uh, opportunities, especially at our conferences. Um, the final part, business education intelligence, um, is really great because actually, even if you are not an AACSB member, you do have access to the insights because they are all on our website. Um, the BIS ad here, well, actually, there's a new name. We call it Link. So, Link Articles. So, it invites insights from business schools um, and it also in invites insights from others who have an interest in influencing business education. So if you just go onto our website, you can actually do a search and you know, read up on articles. Uh, one very hot topic is societal impact. How can business schools um, think about research that aligns with the, the, their mission and that contributes to society? And how do you do it in a strategic way? So we have those um, articles there. Um, industry reports as well. So some of these could be written by um, our AACSB, um, even the chief accreditation officer. So you have some of those that you can search for for free. Um, and the uh, data direct database. So this one is member only benefit. Um, if you are a member school and if you participate in our business school questionnaire, in our surveys, you will get access to the results of these data. So um, aggregate data from other schools will be presented to you in report form. Uh, you can use it for your benchmarking purposes. Uh, so these are some of our upcoming um, conferences. As you can see, uh, not all are accreditation related. Uh, we highlight those two in red because these are the ones that uh, will take place every year, Asia Pacific Forecast. Um, that the one that is coming up next week uh, is not, not necessarily uh, accreditation focus again, but there are still going to be some, some part of it that's discussing um, the hot topics uh, on accreditation. So if you're interested in learning more about AACSB accreditation, uh, we do recommend going for some of our seminars because that's really a good way to build your foundation and also you get to learn uh, directly from experienced facilitators who know the standards. So it's, it goes beyond just reading the free resources. You know, if you read through, sometimes you may not really still, you may not know. So it's good to have that uh, knowledge as well to support. And you can ask questions. So business accreditation looks at the nine standards in that, as well as a bit of the process. Um, assurance of learning, it looks at standard five because that one takes time. Uh, schools find that when they go for it, they, they start to understand how to build a system. Uh, faculty standards and tables. So this looks at uh, standard three, standard eight. Um, how do you develop faculty qualification criteria? So and how do you put compute the data for the tables? Uh, so that's good as well. Uh, strategic planning is a very big um, uh, emphasized part of the standards because your strategic planning drives really is the basis for your school. Uh, it ties in with your mission, your existence. So you need to have a functional plan in order for you to achieve um, your aspirations, your vision. So strategic planning is something new because we realize not a lot of schools are also aware of how to go about it. Um, societal impact is new as well. So this looks at standard nine, um, also at standard one because we tie in the kind of uh, outcomes that you wish to have. How do you progress? Uh, your plans in those areas to reach the outcomes that you want in societal impact. So it's consistent with your, uh, your plans, which is in standard one. Um, and if you are an accredited school, a source of learning tool would be something that you can attend because that one looks at um, schools that have already started their AOL systems and um, you know, they want to continue to improve on it and learn how to make it simpler and more effective for them. Uh, so. With that, I've ended this presentation. And uh, thank you everyone for listening. If you have any questions, of course, you know, can always contact the ACSB office on accreditation. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. So um, that's just to give you an overview of the standards and the process. For some of you, it'll be familiar. For some of you, it will be new. Uh, 
Don't worry, we're not going to give you a test in 10 minutes to see what you've remembered. Ah, you can always come back and ask for more. So at this point, I'll hand back to the organisers for the next step.